Good evening, everyone. This video will explore a very contentious and often sensitive philosophical debate, one that is perennial and as ancient as man's dawning consciousness. It has labored the minds of the most intelligent of men, and yet indicates yet another seemingly irreconcilable opposition, that is, fate versus free will. This polarity presents itself in many guises, for example, freedom versus necessity, determinism, chance, destiny, moira, taiki, and fatalism. The permutations of this argument are endless. Today we'll try to extrapolate some of these concepts, place them in their context, and discuss the issue from three specific sources. The founder of analytical psychology, Carl Jung, 18th century German poet, playwright, novelist, scientist, statesman, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, and finally the application of these ideas to Iamblichus's theurgy and his thoughts on the matter. Carl Jung was deeply influenced by the works of Goethe, particularly his tragic play Faust. Faust is divided into two parts, and the second part of this book intrigued Jung to no end. In fact, he found a thinly veiled exploration and description of alchemy, particularly in this more esoteric and little understood latter half of the work. What's interesting about Goethe is that Jung wasn't simply reading his own ideas into an older work. Goethe is himself considered in many circles as the last link in the golden chain of a traditional secret, because widely unknown, knowledge. His interest in alchemy, hermeticism, orphism, and other religious practices of the ancient Greeks was more than dilettantish curiosity. Furthermore, his theory of color and his understandings of the symbol, or symbolon, are still considered as valuable today as they were groundbreaking in his day. I recently finished a book by a historian specializing in analytical psychology, Paul Bishop. In his work, Reading Goethe at Midlife, Ancient Wisdom, German Classicism, and Young, he devotes a considerable portion of the book on Goethe's understanding of freedom versus necessity. One commonly held view is that we are masters of our own destiny. Here's an excerpt from the last lines of the poem Invictus by William Ernest Henley. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Are we in fact free individuals to choose as we will, to direct our will onto the external environment to be the captains of our soul? Or are we constrained by external circumstances that prevent our self-directed flourishing? Goethe had this to say, one only has to declare oneself to be free. In that moment, one feels oneself as limited. But if one dares to declare oneself to be limited, one feels oneself to be free. This paradoxical statement suggests that the highest form of freedom is not accomplished through outward, external actions, but in the inner formation of the self in conformity with the rhythm of the cosmos. I see in this not passivity or a fatalism that would excuse us from not trying to join the struggle of existence and to forge our way in our lives. On the contrary, I see this akin to the Taoist philosophy of Wu Wei, action through non-action. Mind you, this isn't action through inaction, but in a way, you are aligning yourself with the ever-shifting and moving circumambulation of our inner selves, as representations of the microcosm reflected in the movements of the macrocosm. Goethe's remarks on the acknowledgement of one's limitedness as the key to true freedom strikes me as a very remarkable parallel of Iamblichus's insistence that we need to admit and embrace the soul's absolute descent and embodiment into the world of matter in order to paradoxically achieve union with the divine. This makes tremendous amount of sense since union necessitates a separation. It is in fact a precondition for union. The one needs the dyad 
as much as the dyad needs the one. Essentially, Goethe's resolution of this conflict of opposites is that freedom lies in the consent to necessity, or in Jung's phrasing, free will is doing gladly and freely that which one must do. In essence, one is working alchemical processes on a psychological or spiritual level. External restraint, conceived as fate, is to be transmuted into destiny or internal freedom. Some ancient Stoic sources can be quoted here to illustrate this perspective. Epictetus writes, Require not things to happen as you wish, but wish them to happen as they do happen, and you will go on well. And Cleanthes, conduct me, Jove, and thou, O destiny, whenever your decrees have fixed my station. I follow cheerfully, and did I not, wicked and wretched, I must follow still. There is some parallel here with the amor fati of Nietzsche, I should add as a side note, the love of one's fate. In the 3rd century BCE, the Stoics gave much thought to the idea of astral fate. They coined the term haimarmene, which can mean both fate in the general sense and compulsion by the stars in an astrological sense. Moira is derived from the same root as haimarmene, and its definition is allotment. Allotment meaning the essential purpose of an individual part within the whole. The Moirai are also the three sister goddesses who personify fate and weave the threads of human action. Their equivalent in Norse mythology are the Norns. Their names are Clotho, Atropos, and Lachesis. This fate acts as astral compulsion, but also fate serves as a guiding process towards a teleological goal, that is, the movement of the individual's life that will fulfill the requirements of his or her soul. Now let's bring ourselves back from the 2,000 feet heights we were just traversing and make this as practical as we can, because ultimately all of these myths are incredibly practical. One thing to understand about the work of Jung is that he understood that the psyche is not just psychological. To describe a phenomenon in psychological terms is not to reduce it or to cast judgment on the experience felt by the person. The psyche is vastly mysterious, hidden, dark to our consciousness, and the source of all magic. Our conscious selves are like the very tip of an iceberg that deepens into unfathomable depths. Young often bemoaned our devaluation of the psyche. We choose to explore uncharted territories, sail to the ends of the earth and fly to the moon, but all the time belittling the unknown depths in the world of our own psyche. We have tremendous fears of contagions and diseases that may affect our bodies, and so we immunize ourselves, practice good hygiene, and yet we overlook epidemics of the psyche, destructive ideas that can take possession of us like viruses and spread like wildfire, and yet we're not inoculated to the most deadly threats to our very own existence. After this slight tangent, let's return to where we left off. What Jung is intimating here, and if you read very carefully all of his collected works, his black books and the red book, you will see that he's trying to get us to realize that we are not masters in our own homes. This unfathomable darkness of the unconscious acts like the invisible roommate you didn't even know you had, yet disrupts your tidy home. And here is the most difficult thing for many people to accept. We are so deluded by language and words that we mistake the word for the thing itself. There is a reality behind that word. The term unconscious is simply a word. It is an indication of something autonomous and yet undefinable. It has agency and power over us. In Jung's understanding, what has power over you and can compel you is a god. Your god can be illicit drugs, alcohol, chocolate, your mother, your wife, or your husband. 
anything that exceeds you and has a certain libido or energy is a god or a higher being. For example, when a man becomes enraged and beats his wife, many times the woman will often say, oh, he's not normally like that. And the man himself will also insist that something comes over him. This is classic possession. Violence and brutality are characteristics of Mars, the warrior god. The deeper you delve into myths, the more you'll see various facets of these entities. Jung said that the affects are gods. We've only made them sound clinical. After all, what is pandemonium, or panic, or lunatic? They arise when particular emotions overwhelm us. They're compounded in power inside a mob, in mental illnesses, in depression. There is a Saturnian melancholic character to depression descent into Hades and the underworld, a land of slowness, darkness, leadenness, and heaviness. Many people also use the expression, an idea came to me. Now someone may argue that these are just expressions of language, but the perspective that gave rise to these expressions is innate to how we think, or at least to how we used to think before the progression of historical and philosophical events distanced us from a more embodied understanding of reality. An excellent book entitled Asceticism of the Mind by Inbar Graver demonstrates that Christian monastic communities in the first century CE often used the analogy of besieging a castle to describe demonic possession, or possession generally, as we would understand it obsession-like symptoms like intrusive, repetitive thoughts, images or impulses that are unacceptable and or unwanted and give rise to subjective resistance. After all, the etymological root of the word obsession is from the Latin obsidere, to besiege. In Jung's words, he delicately touches upon this idea and relates it back to the question of fate. Each of us is equipped with a psychic disposition that limits our freedom in high degree and makes it practically illusory. We do not enjoy masterless freedom. We are continually threatened by psychic factors which, in the guise of natural phenomena, may take possession of us at any moment. Principalities and powers are always with us. We have no need to create them even if we could. We can explore Young's astrological inquiries in a later video. What has yet to be explored in any real depth is Young's explorations of Iamblichus's thought. In fact, it has been evident that Young was reading Iamblichus's difficult works like the Mysterious in the original Greek, so it shouldn't come as any surprise to find parallels in their thought. Let's touch upon some of Iamblichus's basic cosmological understandings. Iamblichus speaks of three levels of fate. Each one is regulated by one of the Morai. The non-wandering portion of fate are the fixed stars, governed by Clotho. The wandering portion of fate being the revolving planets and their alignments with Atropos. And finally the fate that is regulated down here on Earth, governed by Lachesis. It is important to keep in mind that there is something greater and above fate, and that is providence or pronoia, which is foresight or foreknowing. Here is a crucial difference, as Shaw states. Although all is contained within fate, not everything is subject to or conforms strictly to fate. This begins to get rather complicated, and these discussions tend to involve the presence of the personal daemon, who acts essentially as a conduit and provides the person with the gnosis and prognosis, and allows reception of the pronoia. These daemons carry out the will of the 36 deacon gods, each representing 10 degrees of the full zodiacal circle. These daemons are energia, pure activity. That is precisely what fate is. It is action that is brought about by these energies. Plotinus sums this up succinctly. Since God gives humans soul, the gods born through the heavens, that is the planets, give them passions. But we also have our chosen demon, 
and the ability to control our passions, our reactions to events. To try to wrap up this video, it is important to end with Jung's grappling with fate and free will. The archetypes have been projected from the unconscious into the very fabric of matter and the cosmos. Jung identified the sympathetic nature between these archetypes and each of the symbols of the zodiac and their correspondences in the human psyche through each individual's innate temperament and disposition. The key, therefore, to transcending this fate is to be conscious and perceptive of our mental and emotional tendencies and to identify when they're about to be inflamed before that actually happens so that we're not unconsciously being led by our noses through our affects that reside within us but outside of our awareness. For now, let's end it here. We'll certainly dive in deeper next time. Have a great evening.